Hello and welcome to this DW Business Special. I'm Christy Platson, and we will be looking at Turkey, or Turkiya, as the country would apparently like to be known. This week, Ankara asked the United Nations to start using the Turkish pronunciation in English communications. Does this country of 85 million people think it needs to change its image, perhaps away from the bird? Well, whatever you want to call it, Turkey or Turkiya has more than just an image problem. It's facing inflation that's growing as fast as its currency is falling. It has two wars on its doorstep, and even the one bright spot, rapid growth, doesn't look like it can get Turkey out of this predicament. Now, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says he'll do everything to keep the economy growing. With all our resources and determination, we continue to fight against the attacks that target our economy through currency, interest, inflation, evil triangle. We pay a high price in economy, also due to the global health care and security crises. Despite all this, by God's willing, we continue to find new ways and new tools to maintain economic growth. So many things seemingly going wrong in Turkey. I have our Turkey correspondent, Yulia Han, with me. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Right. And now, of course, Erdogan has been in power around 20 years now, and he uh, campaigned on a platform of economic growth. What has gone wrong? Oh, what an opening question. What happened in the last 20 years? A lot happened and we could probably talk about this all day. But you mentioned something very important here. Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his AKP won power back in the early 2000s on a promise to improve the lives of millions of people, on a promise to break with the mismanagement and recessions that had long frustrated the country. He basically brought about a decade of relative prosperity, unemployment, inflation, poverty went down. He even promised to make his country one of the largest economies in the world by 2023. And then at some point, this so-called economic miracle started failing. Some said it happened in 2013 when Turkey saw massive anti-government protests, the so-called Gezi Park protests, which were quashed by Erdogan's government. And then, of course, another breaking point was the failed coup attempt in 2016. After those events, Erdogan took an increasingly authoritarian turn where he tried to centralize all decision making in the economy and the monetary policy as well. He at some point started firing central bank governors and other policymakers who did not agree with him. And I think that has seriously eroded global markets and investors' trust in the independence of uh, Turkey's institutions. And now we have a situation where we have a currency crisis, skyrocketing inflation, rising poverty levels and increasing despair among the population. And uh, there are elections coming up in Turkey. They're scheduled for uh, early summer next year. And many observers say that it's the economy that will decide about the country's and President Erdogan's political future. Isn't that always the way when it comes to elections, we're always talking about mm -hmm. the economy. I'd like to take a closer look at those figures uh, right now. Uh, Turkey's economic growth rate actually exceeded expectations for the first quarter of 2022, mm -hmm. 7.3 percent, so higher than analysts had actually estimated. Right. Um, but uh, the analysts are skeptical that uh, that they can continue this kind of growth, uh, considering the record mm -hmm. high levels of inflation that Turkey is experiencing right now. Uh, despite an unexpectedly strong 2021 due to a boom in exports, the country's GDP has roller coastered on a steady decline over the last 10 years. War in neighboring countries hasn't made anything easier, of course, mm -hmm. and ordinary Turks are feeling a pinch. Let's take a listen. In the 1980s and 90s, we used to be able to support a household with just one income. Now four of us have to work, and we still hardly make ends meet. I wonder how they calculate that inflation rate. Those economists who make speeches sitting in their palace, who wear nice ties while speaking on TV, well, they should come here to the markets to see how we're really doing. Now, uh, Yulia, you've lived in Turkey for some time right now, and we're just hearing that things are getting harder for people, mm. not easier. Um, can you explain this a little bit? 
Well, I think um, that growth rates, high growth rates, uh, don't necessarily tell us much about people's living conditions. Growth in Turkey under the Erdogan administration has largely been driven by uh, credits channeled into the country's um, real estate and construction sectors. But economists say you actually have to look at other indicators. You have to look at inflation rates, poverty rates, unemployment to get a better understanding of the situation. And all these figures look pretty grim. Youth unemployment in Turkey is, for example, above 20 percent. Um, inequality is on the rise. There is high private debt and many people, opposition politicians, analysts, voters say that uh, the government's current policies are, instead of alleviating those problems are making things worse. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like Erdogan ignores all the problems, says they don't exist, and then praises uh, high interest, uh, high growth rates. Um, he does acknowledge the hardship caused by, especially by high inflation, but he fundamentally disagrees with conventional economic theory on how to tackle these problems. And he has also framed the current economic crisis, uh, particularly the Turkish lira plunging in value, as some kind of plot by foreign powers to destabilize his country. And uh, many observers say that is actually also part of the problem. A lot to unpack there. I want to jump on one point that you mentioned, um, which is inflation, of course. Yeah. We're hearing a lot about this out of Turkey. I mean, inflation there is the highest it's been since mm -hmm. Erdogan came to power in 2003. And um, analysts say it's a result of this policy that mm -hmm. you mentioned of slashing interest rates while prices are high. And this goes against a widely accepted economic theory, yeah. as far as I understand. Uh, now, Turkey's National Statistics Agency reported 73.5% inflation exactly. for consumer prices in May. During the same time last year, this was a r below 17%. Mm -hmm. It rose gradually until the end of 2021, when it jumped 15% between November and December and has just the kept on day. climbing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, Yulia, back to you with a question about that. Um, can we talk more about why inflation is such a problem in Turkey specifically. Maybe talk about this policy of Erdogan. Well, of course, um, inflation isn't only a problem in, in Turkey. Uh, we see uh, inflation racing upwards across the globe uh, because of um, supply disruptions, because of the pandemic, the war in Ukraine. I believe we have about 8% uh, annual inflation in Germany sure. right now, which is the highest level since reunification. But in Turkey, the inflation problem is just so much worse, more than 70 percent. Imagine That's that crazy. figure. And um, this problem is, uh, to a large extent, self-inflicted. That's what economists say. It's a result of President Erdogan commandeering the central bank and his disdain for higher interest rates. Because, and I'm trying to explain this as, as simple as possible, because um, in general, normally in an economy, when you see that inflation is starting to become a problem, a nation's central bank uh, would uh, raise borrowing costs uh, in order to slow the economy, to uh, sap um, basically uh, what people are spending, and, and then to this this way, rein in the price hikes. Mm. But Turkey has been doing the exact opposite because of President Erdogan, because he believes that high interest rates are un-Islamic and they are evil. And this is giving many economists inside the country and outside headaches. All right. Well, just speaking exactly to that point, uh, we spoke with economist Errol Yalsen earlier about this unorthodox approach. Mm. Let's hear what he had to say. The policy that is conducted in Turkey in terms of monetary policy is fundamentally wrong. We have declared this, it's not only me, there's general uh, criticism across the world. The central bank in Turkey has to increase uh, the interest rates. And uh, the only reason why uh, Turkey uh, is doing this is, as, as you indicate, there is political pressure on the central bank and there are elections next year. Uh, incomes in Turkey suffer, they don't gain, they, there is nothing which is transmitted to the households. So it's a fundamentally wrong policy. Okay, he said nothing transmitted to the households. Um, again, you live in Turkey. Can you tell me how is it for people there? 
I mean, you know, when we talk about inflation, it's always uh, very, you know, complicated. But uh, if we look at this figure again, more than 70 percent annual inflation, according to the official data, what does it mean? It means that um, if you want to buy things from food products to baby diapers, they are now more than 70 percent more expensive than they were last year around this time. Um, and um, that is an eye-popping figure, but many people still believe that this is an understatement. Wow. In fact, there are polls according to which people believe uh, the official inflation rate is actually way beyond 100%. At the same time, um, Turks have seen their currency massively depreciate against the euro and the dollar. So what they earn, the money they make, is losing value while the things they need to buy in order to survive are getting more and more expensive. Of course, this is causing widespread frustration and it's causing existential fears. Um, I speak with shopkeepers who tell me they're barely able to keep up with the price hikes. They have to change price tags for the products they sell several times a month. I speak with mothers who tell me that they don't know how to put food on the table. Um, they don't know how to feed their children and sometimes have to send them to bed hungry. And I speak with um, young people who tell me their only hope is to, to leave the country for good because they don't see a future in Turkey. That is very sad. It's terrible. It would be terrible for any country. Very bleak picture that you're describing there. Um, obviously, there's more than just monetary policy playing a role in this. Um, let's hear what some people had to say yeah. about that. I link this situation to bad economic policies and to the conflict in Syria. I think these two are the basic reasons. And I also link this to corruption. Our resources line the pockets of our leaders and go to companies with ties to the government. The people are forgotten. We are all in dire straits. So, Yulia, I want to talk to you about corruption in Turkey here for a minute. Uh, now, Erdogan uh, also campaigned on a platform of getting rid of the cronyism of his predecessors. Uh, mm. uh, but that doesn't seem to be something that he's delivered on. What can you tell me about that? Well, you know, uh, what the lady there said is something we, we often hear. There have been um, quite a number of serious corruption claims leveled against the president and members of his government in recent years. Um, the government has always dismissed them as fake, uh, but there also haven't been really independent investigations into this. Um, the, the media aren't really allowed to freely report about issues like corruption or mismanagement. In fact, um, reporters who do uh, face being sent to court or even to prison. There has been an unprecedented crackdown on, on press freedom in Turkey in recent years. But I think all of this somehow uh, leads to people losing trust. Um, they look at their own financial situation. Uh, they look how they, they see how they struggle to pay their monthly bills. And then they see the president in his gigantic palace uh, that he um, had built for himself in the capital, Ankara. And and I think some people um, think that he is no longer this man of the people that he once used to be. Sure. And I think this is why we, we keep hearing people also complaining about um, increasing corruption in Turkey. Right, right, right. I mean, we're talking about a lot of doom and gloom here in Turkey. Um, I want to narrow in now for a second on one Turkish export that's actually performing quite well lately, getting a lot of attention. I'm talking about the Turkish Bayraktar, um, par pardon me, uh, Bayrak Bayraktar, Bayraktar drones, yes, thank exactly, you, the Bayraktar exactly. drones, mm -hmm. um, which have been uh, used in Ukraine um, since pretty much right after Russia mm -hmm. invaded the country. Um, their success in, in destroying Russian combat vehicles has sparked major interest among other, from other militaries, mm -hmm. including Finland. Um, and now that country is saying it might be in the market to buy Turkish drones um, mm -hmm. if it were to join NATO. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Turkey is, of course, a NATO member, and it has threatened uh, to block Finland and Sweden's entry into that military alliance. Um, now, Ankara has been walking a very tight line uh, between Ukraine and Russia, uh, but it has sent these drones, but it has uh, so far uh, steered away from applying sanctions to Russia, for example. Where does Turkey find itself in uh, this whole conflict uh, when it comes to Russia's war in Ukraine? 
Yeah, it's a little like you said, they're dancing on a tight rope, where on the one hand, they are supportive of Ukraine. Turkey is a NATO member. It has the second largest um, army in the alliance. Uh, but then they also have very close ties uh, with Moscow, and they depend on Russian energy and agriculture imports, on Russian tourists as well. And I think this is a big part of the explanation why Ankara is very careful in dealing with Russia trying not to anger Mr. Putin. So, so this is the, the balancing act there. One word maybe about the Russian tourists, because the hope for this year of, of Turkey's very crucial tourism industry was to basically go back to uh, pre-pandemic figures. Mm -hmm. um, and Russia is a, a top tourist sending destination. Uh, last year, we had, I think, 4.5 million Russian tourists and another two million from Ukraine. And this year, um, expectations had to be lowered uh, drastically uh, due to the war. And a lot of people working in the tourism industry I speak with are pretty, uh, pretty desperate. Um, the government's role in this whole conflict is also that they're trying to mediate between the two sides. Um, they have managed to get um, some high level talks to Turkey, and they're working on a meeting between the two presidents, Mr. Zelensky and Mr. Uh, Putin. Um, but many are wondering for how long Turkey can really, you know, continuing continue with this uh, balancing act, because it is causing tensions. It's causing uh, tensions with Ukraine. It's causing tensions with Russia. It's causing tensions with NATO. And you just mentioned uh, that Turkey uh, is threatening to, to block uh, Sweden's and Finland's bids for NATO membership. Um, and that is, yeah. That is something that I think is frustrating many people in, in NATO right now. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely one we'll be watching uh, as this uh, conflict, unfortunately, continues to drag on, seeing what Turkey's going to do there. Um, we've talked about a lot of things today. Just to wrap things up now, I want to take a step back and also mm -hmm. take a look back in time a little bit. I mean, it was just over nine years ago that we saw major unrest um, emerging in Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, talking there about the uh, Gezi Park demonstrations, but also protests that um, yeah. spread across the country at that time due to a wide range of concerns. Uh, we've spoken about a wide range of concerns today. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me, uh, do you think that there is a uh, potential for another era like this uh, to come, especially in light, uh, or I should say, how do you also think this might affect general elections, uh, which are set for next year? Well, it's very difficult to say, you know, because um any kind of public expression of uh, dissent. There, there has been very little tolerance for that in recent years, uh, with the police, you know, cracking down on protests, anti-government protests. Um, and they have actually, um, a Turkish court actually just recently handed down very long um, jail sentences for several people um, for their alleged involvement in those Gezi protests. They were accused of having tried to violently topple the government that has sent shockwaves through civil society uh, with human rights organizations screaming, oh no, what's going on here? Um, so I guess a lot of people are afraid to take to the streets or they are simply tired. But I also do think that a lot of people are waiting for the elections to happen, hoping that they will serve as some kind of uh, catalyst. Um, if we look at the approval ratings of President Erdogan himself and of his ruling AKP, they are historically low. And that is mostly because of the desperate economic situation that has become a real problem for President Erdogan. Yes, it could spell his end, but if I've learned one thing um, in my time being a correspondent in Turkey, it's um, a lot can happen within a year's time. Um, it's very difficult to make predictions. Um, but definitely this combination of a collapsing economy and plummeting support for Erdogan, it has put him in a very vulnerable position. And I think um, the next months leading up to the election are going to be everything but boring. Well, you'll obviously be in Istanbul and we'll be checking in with you to follow along uh, with that for us. That is actually our show today, uh, our special look at Turkey or Turkia. Um, and if um, if the government has its way, I should say. Uh, thank you a lot to Yulia Han for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was thank great. You. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, remember to hit like and subscribe. And why not check out some of our other stuff on the D D DW News YouTube channel. From me and the whole team here in Berlin, goodbye. And until next time, take care.